welcome and thank you for joining Emergency Disease Control, African Swine Fever. Before we begin, please ensure you've opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. There will be the opportunity for Q&A at the end of today's presentation. Should you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Tony Pearson. Tony is an engineer and head of technical marketing for biosecurity and hygiene with Antec International Limited, part of the Lancet Group. Tony has held global roles for the business under DuPont, Chemwars, and now Lancet, supporting animal production across many markets and regions while leading Lancet's guides in emergency disease control. In this role, Tony is working with regional governing bodies across many markets, such as China, South Korea, Japan, Colombia, Poland, Germany, Thailand, etc., as challenges arise. And with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Tony. Uh, thanks, Liz, and, and good afternoon, everyone, and good morning in some of the, the Western states. So it's my pleasure to be back talking to this experienced audience, and especially before there's any uh, African swine fever outbreak. During my last discussion in this same forum, we focused on the disease and the prevention measures at farm and industry level. Today, I was asked to focus on a few more specific topics, uh, as you see listed here. And I hope you will not need these. I, I really hope uh, the sticking time bomb of a disease doesn't, doesn't get into your practices and into your farms. But preparation is key for any emergency disease, and I know the, the USDA has been putting together some considerable work and, and protocols on this. So the first part of the discussion will be about the depopulation and, and biosecurity in, in general around these measures. But firstly, I'd just like to highlight on a couple of markets where we've been working with this virus for seven and 11 years, uh, respectively. I have been, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I was just back from China on Sunday. I was there working with key accounts, but the situation there remains very dynamic. Um, and drawing examples from there would, would be difficult at this time to, uh, to guide us in prevention or, or protocols to, to help but certainly we can learn from, from what's happening. So firstly, uh, Russia. And what you see there is Russia has had this disease continually for the last 11 years. Um, what you can see, the, the red and the blue is different between the wild boar and the domestic pig infections and contagions and cross contaminations. And we started off a little bit slowly, if you like, uh, did some quite good controls from a federal point and, and a regional state view until so those bigger outbreaks in, in 2013, the wild boars got more control. Then there was uh, a downtrend, and unfortunately we have to say that the biosecurity did uh, relapse, I would say. There was less control on the vehicles between the borders of the state, and we had the big outbreaks again, and it still continues today. But the pictures you, you see there are courtesy of uh, uh, Dr. Konolova from, from PIC there in Russia. This is what you don't want to happen. You really don't want to see this type of uh, depopulation. And I, I unfortunately thought that uh, when I was dealing with a foot and mouth disease in 2001 in the UK and experienced this massive burning of, of animals, that would be a once in a lifetime experience. So it's been quite devastating to, to find that this is reoccurring with this particular disease. The pictures you see there are, are from 2018. But even this year still, we're having uh, critical outbreaks in Russia. So well, the lesson here is even when the disease happens, it's going to be there for some considerable time. For example, we know it took Brazil six years to eradicate and Portugal 40 years. You know, this is a really uh, challenging disease. The other example, and, and where we draw some of our experience, is in Poland. Poland has also had this, this challenge now for, for seven years. And if you look at the map of Poland, the, the west is where there's a huge uh, population of pigs. In the east, not as many, but we can see 3,000 plus outbreaks in wild boars. So the control of wild boars, the culling of wild boars, the fencing of wild boars, all these have been things that have been going on for some considerable time. 
but at the same time, the farms have really invested in, in biosecurity measures for gate controls and barriers. So outbreaks of last year, we learned some new lessons. We can see there on the bottom right-hand side, the outbreaks were unlikely in summer, but they grew in summer. So recently, uh, more control on flies has been uh, broadcast and is an investigation. But also, in those countries, the wild boar nest in crops, and those crops, the straw is then put into bedding for some of the dry sows, and that's where we picked up some challenge. So today, when we look at some of the controls that we put in place, um, they are somewhat journalistic in, in, in nature from, from some reports, but also gained from our experience. So this is a decontamination where nobody wants to be. Um, from the, the stages that we go through, from diagnosis, shutting down the farm, cleaning and disinfecting the site after we had to cull animals, and then there's another key part, the training and the new biosecurity protocols that we have to put in place. When you've had an outbreak of African swine fever, you've had a breakdown of biosecurity. This is not an airborne disease, except when you're in an area where there are these uh, soft ticks, which we'll cover a little bit later, because it's an arbor virus. So we have to review all the areas, clean and disinfect, and then place sentinel pigs. Poland and Russia have both successfully repopulated farms. As I said, I was in China last week, and they have only successfully repopulated three or four farms out of a devastated uh, industry. So they are still having to learn, and they are basically trying to rush too much. When we look at the specific uh, standard operating practices, these will differ from farm to farm. All I can explain today is some of the measures uh, that we have gained from experience, some things that we should do on a regular basis. And in my experience, a return, if you like, to basic biosecurity husbandry practices would have been a really good start in, in those countries with the outbreaks. For example, when I was growing up, I'm, I'm a third generation farmer. When we had a sick pig, you would move it to a pen where there was only sick pigs. Today, due to the stocking densities and availability, cost reductions, capital investments, that is seldom happened. Normally, a pig is treated it gets a blue mark or a red mark or a stripe on its back and left where it is to have a look at it. That, that should stop. We should go back to the basics. When there's an animal showing any sign, move it to a, um, a quarantine area, if you like, or at least available pens should be made ready for, for livestock. This disease looks so much like other diseases that the veterinarians who have not had the experience could easily think, if you look at the right-hand picture, oh, We've got PERS. But then you suddenly see the mortality increasing and you realize maybe this is something else. By that stage, it's, honestly, it's too late. This is a highly contagious uh, challenge. So with any sick animals, move them to um, a quarantine area. Any mortalities, always move them with a biosecure practice. This should happen whatever you're doing. So any, any area where the pig has died should be disinfected, the equipment should be disinfected, movement of the pigs should be disinfected. Uh, in our company, we learned this not just in the animal health side, but also the human health side. Uh, we had to deal, unfortunately, with cases of Ebola, and there you spray the people that have died before you move them so that you can reduce risk. And learning from that and passing that and leveraging that into the farms. So. As soon as you have the challenge, isolate, carry out diagnostics. Uh, the preparation you do today is making sure you know where that diagnostic can be carried out, know who to contact, inform authorities, and any deliveries of feed from that point on must be tipped off by security, uh, vehicles for, and the drivers. And please alert neighbors of, of any disease. The challenge we've had in China is it's so secretive that they didn't tell each other what was happening. Uh, advise neighbors, call them, obviously don't visit them. When we look at the actual decontamination and hygiene for the culling process, there should be a guide, and there is a guide from the USDA, there's also guides from the FAO, and I would seriously recommend reading their uh, carcass management for small and medium scale livestock farms and applying it to large farms. The first thing you can do today is, in case there's a challenge, 
think about where would I actually bury those eggs, where would I incinerate them? And without being pessimistic, that area could either be prepared or at least identified, because when this happens, speed is key. Moving dead animals to the cold zone, uh, euthanizing and removing livestock, all have to be done. One key point, I think, is to make sure that it is possible to cull the pigs by giving them lethal injection uh, on the transport and not in the houses. If the pigs die in the houses, there's bodily fluids uh, oozing in the houses, and this can actually increase the, the level of contagion in those houses, making it more difficult for us later. Follow the guide to the culling zone. Always make sure that you, you open the stomachs when you're burying or incinerating animals. Make sure you can relieve those gas. We don't want any explosions during incineration or bloating that, that will cause the ground to heave after we've actually done any burials. Agricultural lime, not expensive. Keep it on hand. It's a great uh, product for, for putting over these carcasses, changing the pH of the environment, and breaking down some of that uh, uh, body matter in, in reasonable time. And pigs are either burned or buried. Any soiled areas where the pigs have actually come in contact while you've been moving is dug up and buried with the pigs. Again, the whole area typically is lime. Uh, you can use bleaching powder. You could use uh, disinfectant. Uh, but this um, changing the pH, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail later, changing the pH of the environment is a really good way of stopping this virus from having time to incubate, which takes 3 to 15 days, and spreading. The whole area around any decontamination burial site has to be fenced off. You're not going to be occupying that land for some considerable time. Um, you're going to have rodent controls, everything put in place. So as soon as that is done, we then have to make sure everything we used during this process, all the roadways, all the equipment, diggers, um, fully disinfected. Any clothing, bedding used while the team was doing this work, burn it and disinfect all the areas where the, sh the, the, the workers have been, the showers, the canteens. So what the whole idea is we're trying to decontaminate the whole area before we start the clean and disinfect protocols for the barn, and then we're going to have to do the process again. If you try and do everything at the same time, it gets confused, and there's a break. And then this is one of the reasons leading to failures of uh, repopulation. The biggest challenge will probably be the slurry pits. Uh, depending whether you have lagoons or closed pits or you've got biogas, so far the only option that we've had is, again, either using agricultural lime, bleaching powder, or caustic course, soda, changing the pH of that environment. This virus typically survives from around 3.5, 3.9 to 11.5 pH, or it's stable in those environments. There's also a... Um, a report recently from, from Poland where they said there was uh, pH stability up to 13.5 pH. So that could be because they've had the virus for some time and it's adapting. I'm not sure. I've only seen that in, in one report. But changing the pH of the environment is a key factor. When we think about the protocols and how to clean and disinfect, we must again refer back and understand this virus. It's a highly contagious virus. It's a multi-layered envelope virus. But we can't use the same techniques that we would use for a normal envelope virus. For so those of you working in cross species, you can think of avian influenza and, and Newcastle diseases as envelope viruses. They are much more intolerant than this. This, this is so tolerant to, to environments and uh, situations. And it's an ar arbovirus. Excuse me. And it's an arbovirus, which means it can be transmitted by blood-biting insects such as the soft ticks, who or which were responsible for the longevity of African swine fever virus in Portugal. It's resilient. It withstands low temperatures. We've seen those increased outbreaks in higher temperatures. So the pictures on the left-hand side, pretty usual. You'll find this in most literature. What you haven't found in most literature is probably the pictures on the right-hand side. I'm sure in the USA you would not go to the level of the two pictures on the far right-hand side. This is what is causing us a huge challenge in China and also Vietnam. 
the people have simply dumped the dead pigs into the rivers. Some people have been drawing water from those same rivers for their cleaning and disinfection. So you can imagine just how that recycling is, is going on. In the central area, I just draw your attention to the fact if you have wild boars, and, and you have a lot in, in the USA, I, I covered that in recent um, uh, presentations I was giving in, in the USA in July, the boars, they nest in the straw areas, they nest in the wheat, they nest in the oats, and if you're using any of those crops within a short time after harvest or bedding up, there's a potential cross-contamination right there. In, in Europe, we have to use uh, straw as a welfare, uh, going in to give fiber to the animals, and if that is a new crop, that could be a contagion. Also, the bottom picture, again, you won't have this in the USA, unless there are some rural areas. But this is where um, grain is dried on central roads. The boars salivate, cross-contaminate the grain, and then we have extra challenges. So the picture on the left was a great guide, but the experience that we've experienced over this last uh, seven and eight months, there's a lot more challenges that we have to think about and uh, incorporate in our chat and incorporate with the protocols. The longevity has got new data as well. 25 days in slurry, 60 days in water, so you can just imagine how long the, the challenge is uh, replicating with this in China, dumping pigs in the river. But also, the six years at five degrees with no light. You think about a farm, where could we possibly have cool, dark areas and slurry uh, channels pretty much uh, cover that area. So we need to put extra focus into such areas to make sure that we have the reduction of this challenge. So decontamination and, and actions in the hygiene specifically. Before we start the cleaning process, again, advise neighbors you're going through the process. One of the biggest challenges of any uh, biosecurity, in the cleaning, we use high pressure hoses. We all do it, but it, it's probably the only way we can visually see what's going on, but this makes an aerosol of the challenge. And while this is not an airborne virus, if we create aerosols that can drift in prevailing winds, we can cross-contaminate and spread. So first of all, don't do the cleaning on windy days. You've got plenty of time. You've got three or four months to get this job done. Use days when it's the least risk to your neighbors. Before we move any of the equipment or waste, in an emergency disease situation, we apply a suitable biocide as for the manufacturer's guide dilutions and contact time, probably around 30 minutes, a, a spray over everything before we start moving things. If we can reduce the risk of spraying disease through the hygiene process, that will be a great start. Removing organic matters, this is pretty basic. In the houses with slatted pores, we need to lift those for adequate cleaning. And in those cases where you've got these slurry channels, remember five degrees, six years of activity, put some lime into those channels, some agricultural lime powder, so that when you're doing the rinsing later, that washes through and changes the pH environment of that area. That area will be typically concrete. Concrete is alkaline by nature, so if we can stimulate that into, into a more alkaline base, we can actually help reduce the challenge. First thing I would recommend is to drain all the water pipes. This is again back to normal biosecurity, but remembering that the virus can survive in water, as you saw there, 60 days, you know, this is two months. So we've got to make sure those waters are clear, uh, no cross-contamination coming through for the next time. In, in this case, I would make sure we use a, a perfect time to get rid of all the biofilms, use a formulated alkaline detergent to the pipes, give it a soaking period, give it a rinse, and then apply an oxidative chemistry so it can scour the, the pipes get rid of that biofilm that's in there. Um, and if you see some real bad mess coming out of the pipes, do it a second time. The water pipes is a key factor for the, for the production in general. Make the best of this period, get those lines uh, really clean. Before we use the formulated alkaline detergent, I always recommend, and this is typical nowadays, we soak all the surfaces with water. That is to allow the detergent to be absorbed. It doesn't dilute the detergent. That is, that is not a, a recommended um, theory, in my opinion. The allow the detergent to soak on the surface, as for the product guide, 
rinse with medium pressure if you can, high pressure in certain areas. Um, but just remember, don't do that around the outside of the houses when it's a windy day. Don't try to reduce this cross-contamination. As soon as the cleaning is done, check the cleaning, visual inspection. I've seen farms in, in the USA when I've done audits, they go quite well around doing the visual inspection. But you need to take swabs as well, surface swabs, either by contact or by swabbing, and wait for the results of those swab tests. If there's still high levels of bacteria, that means dirt, means biofilm, do it again. We've got time. In this situation, it's not about rushing to get the next uh, crop in, uh, next herd of uh, pigs. It's about getting this thing decontaminated. So do it again. Cleaning is, uh, is the key. Disinfectants are only tested to a four to six log reduction, 99.99%. The EPA is actually four to just over four log reduction. They accept the 3.75 pass for registration of the product at 20 degrees uh, centigrade. So EPA is, is a good guide, but we, we really need um, a great clean surface before that's applied. So after the surfaces are dry, uh, check again visually for dirt, biofilm, and dust. If there's a dust layer, rinse again with a medium pressure. Uh, top to bottom, allow to dry and swab again. If you see that, that picture there on, on the left-hand side, that's a typical global guide on 90% of the time we, we spend on cleaning and 10% we, we spend on uh, disinfection. But actually, that's not good enough for African swine fever. On the top right, you'll see how infectious the disease is at very low levels of uh, contamination. So we've really got to get this disinfection perfect, disinfect the house, and allow them to dry. When you're thinking about which disinfectant to, lose, to, to use, sorry, you must think about temperature, the pH, the water hardness, organic challenges, and safety in use, of course. Temperature, you probably will not have the same protocol if you have an outbreak or a decontamination in the summer, the autumn, winter, or spring. Temperatures affect chemistries dynamically. Some chemistries are not affected. Oxidative chemistries typically are not affected by temperature, but aldehydes are affected, phenolics are affected, and quater ammoniums are affected. Those last three all work better in warm temperatures. So you could heat buildings to make them work better, but a lot of the areas won't be heated. So you have to really think about dilutions and what you're going to use. Think also about the pH. Remember the stability, 3.5 up to uh, 11.5 and higher. So we should be using chemistries that are either below or at least at those levels or above that pH. We need to knock down this virus successfully. That small table showing the, the different viruses, uh, not going back to my, my first presentation, but this really behaves like PCV2, not PERS, even though it's an envelope virus. So from a default point of view, think of it as PCV2. And how would you actually control that, a non-envelope virus, not thinking about it as an envelope virus? As soon as you've done the, the disinfection, place the foot dips, close off the room, and we recommended uh, leaving the house empty for three months based on experience that we've seen globally. Four months in Russia, some farms are left for eight months. Again, could be seasonal challenge, um, but in China, they're just trying to do it too fast. But three months would be the minimum time to go back in, have a look, see what's going on, taking swabs. We'll, we'll cover that on a couple of slides. So once you've got the, the house done, the barns done, we've got to start applying around the houses. Around the immediate house, we would recommend a residual disinfectant to those areas. Again, think about those temperatures, the pH, the environment. And the wider areas, keep the vegetation cut very low and apply agricultural lime to those areas to change the pH of the environment. Changing the pH is a really great way to bring down this, this challenge, and not just this challenge, in most of the emergency diseases that you'll find. The only challenge also you get when you put a lime the vegetation quite likes it, so you've got to keep that trimmed as well. While the houses are now empty, this is a key time to start repairing any exteriors of the, of the houses, roadways, new concrete areas, minimize vegetation areas, upgrade barriers and fencing. 
What I have noticed from some audits in the U.S. is we don't really have that much barriers and fencing around the farms. People can get quite close. If people can get quite close, the feral boars, the wild boars can get quite close. So we'll cover that a little bit later, but that's probably one of the key areas I would focus on. Upgrade the operator facilities for hygiene controls, train the teams, conduct a full hazard of the farm, a hazard analysis of the critical control points. How did the biosecurity break down to give you the African swine fever? It's a breakdown of biosecurity. That's the way it comes in. It's a contact disease. So something didn't work. Make sure you've got sustained rodents, put endicide policies. If you are in an area with the soft ticks, those, you have to start using some pyrethroids around the houses, bring down those levels uh, as well. So it's a complete biosecurity. We're only just covering very basics today of, of hygiene. Sorry, pressing the wrong, uh, wrong button there. I can't actually see the button, so. Here. Excuse me just a moment. I seem to, oh, there we are. So after your three or four months period, you've got some empty houses. When you're going back in, again, check all the surfaces. If you left any level of, of microbe in there, it's been replicating. If it's summertime, if it's winter, you've probably got less of a challenge. But check all the surfaces. While you're waiting for the swabs to come back, disinfect the water lines again, because if the swabs come back good, you're going to go forward. So it's a great time to, again, disinfect those water lines. You could have had something lying in there. Great time to clear that through. If the swabs are all clean, just rinse the house with a, with a low pressure just to remove any, any dust. If the swabs show heavy counts, then the cleaning protocol should start again until you get the surfaces dry. Disinfecting all the surfaces with a, a non-residual chemistry with proven data would be the next step. And then second step, what we've been doing globally is a thermal fog, as you can see in those pictures. Unfortunately, the EPA doesn't have an approved process for this type of application. What other application could reach all the remote areas? I, I'm not really sure. Um, I think we need to, to, to look at that in more detail with the EPA to understand if they would accept um, a sanitizing effect from a, a thermal fog if they don't accept a full disinfection. Um, I haven't seen another method. I've seen some smoke generators from a company, Fumagri, um, which is a um, sort of a chlorine dioxide type of uh, suspension. But I, I really don't see anything better than these uh, thermal fog applications to get around all those areas and make sure that we're in a great area before we start putting in the sentinel pigs. And sentinel pigs would normally be in there for 30 to 60 days under close scrutiny before we had a full new population. Of course, this all depends on the size of your farms, big farms, medium farms, small farms, but the same principles apply. So when we think about this virus elimination, as I said, you've really got to consider the, the challenges in the particular farm. I looked at the US uh, before I came in July, and you've got areas with soft ticks, you've got um, areas without soft ticks. So you're going to have different protocols in those different areas. And you've really got to think about uh, the, the chemistries that were required. The, one of the questions then was, was looking at truck cleaning and decontamination. So I looked at it, obviously, for, for, because it requested. But what occurred to me is we think of the USA actually as the gold standard for this type of application you actually manage the truck better than anywhere else in the world. Um, and, and I wouldn't be uh, afraid to just keep doing what you're doing, to be honest. But a typical uh, protocol, um, especially with an emergency disease, is you should be sure that any of the loose organic matter is removed before the vehicle goes into the washing area. Especially with a disease uh, with high contagion like African swine fever, normally you'd back up to an area, the, the, the truck would reverse to an area, uh, ground area, uh, an area which can be buried, the material, straw, bedding, designated into that area where the supervisor and the team would, would regularly put organic, uh, I go to line on top of the organic matter to break it down. Really don't, don't bring in that uh, loose bedding and stuff into the vehicle washing area. You just complicate the whole matter and, and atomize the dirt and spread it around. The vehicle entering the washing area, 
um, prepare the vehicle, remove the mats, equipment. This is all pretty standard in, 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 the, in the U.S. guides, to be honest. The washing team pre soaks the vehicle with water, allows the dirt to absorb detergent, just like we would in a, in a building. Applying a formulated alkaline detergent to all the surfaces and letting that soak into the surfaces, typically 10 to 20 minutes. It will depend on the, on the chemistry of the product, how much surfactant there is in the product, how much detergent. You don't want it to dry uh, too hard, otherwise it will be even more stubborn to remove than the dirt it's trying to um, uh, get rid of. Typically, apply some aggression to the stubborn dirt areas with a brush just to make sure you open up some of those uh, biofilm layers uh, that have occurred in the little cracks and crevices and, and ridges. Rinse in an orderly process to avoid splashback of the dirt onto rinsed areas. Again, medium pressure if possible or high pressure with a second rinse with medium or low pressure. You've really got to remember that don't um, put high pressure on the last thing you do is the back gate or the back ramp and then that splatters everything uh, through the house. Periodically, you don't have to do it on every vehicle, but periodically verify the cleaning process. This typical idea is just to understand and recognize the trends where additional attention might be required. When you do the swabbing and you say on the floor, on the wall of the vehicle, on the rims of the tires, or wherever, if you start getting regular counts, that means those areas need to have better training, and it's a, it's a trend of challenge. Designated disinfection area would be available to reduce overall downtime. Typically what we have is we, we have a washing area, then we drive to a disinfection area. If you do everything in the same um, enclosure, enclosed area, it's possible, but you delay the whole process. And normally there's a lot of trucks moving around at the same time. The washing stations I've seen in the U.S. Um, definitely had uh, more than one bay where they could move things around. Once you've got the dry and disinfection to all surfaces, the equipment engaging with a fan jet nozzle. This sounds basic, but I actually saw two or three of the places I visited in the U.S. recently where they were using um, what we call a pencil jet spray. So they were basically using what they used to rinse. They hadn't changed the, um, the, the lance head for a disinfection. So they don't get that full cover. Remember, you've got a vertical, non-porous surface in many cases. So you need a sweeping cover of disinfection onto those areas. A simple point, but, but something I saw recently. Apply the same principles of choosing the disinfectant as we did in the houses. Remember this time, you've got areas um, that you're trying to disinfect that are non-porous and fast drying. So you'll need faster acting chemistry perhaps than you might choose on semi-porous surfaces. Use the data and associated conditions. Make sure what you're applying inactivates what you needed to apply. So as with any disinfection, always make a list of the pathogens that you want to inactivate. While the vehicle is, is disinfection and been disinfected and is drying, sorry, attend to remove mats, all the cab areas, pretty standard stuff, as I said. An additional step that I've noticed um, and I've recommended from people outside the U.S. to copy in Russia, in China, in Poland, uh, I think a couple of us have installed these in Poland, you have this heating system. Um, initially, this was developed around uh, research that was done in the uh, University of Minnesota around the PERS, uh, which recognized, first of all, how long the virus survived in, in damp and wet and cold conditions. So there was a drying period, but also an, in, an inactivation of the virus in, in similar times. And when you look at that, that PERS, uh, 132 degrees Fahrenheit, 56 degrees centigrade, very similar temperatures that you need to actually reduce uh, the activation of African swine fever. So the two things uh, pair up. The USDA guide from, from June last year, um, again, shows the 3.6 to 11.5 pH and around this temperature of 56 to 60. So those are just three simple um, ideas that are, that are available. Um, as again, I'm not limited to any of these uh, commercially, I have to add. But, but simply, this drying technique really does seem to be a, a good option. It's going to take time. So you need to have washing stations that have the washing bay, the disinfection bay, and the drying bay. 
and have probably dedicated teams to each function. Somebody doing the washing, somebody different doing the disinfecting with the fan jet nozzles, and then somebody seeing to this, uh, this whole process. As I said, I think the, the US and, and Canada as well, you have the gold standard. Uh, we copy what you do. So when the question came across, um, I'm happy to look at it and, and I'm happy to, to, to give a brief description, but simply look at these type of guides that are available to you. Um, I shared this presentation with, with my team and they said, oh, send me, send me, send me. They wanted to see these guides. They're really good guides. They follow exactly the procedures that we would probably think of day to day. And really this is um, a good guide from, from the USA Port Board and I recommend that, that you stick to this. And the idea of would you do something more in emergency disease than you do in normal disease? I think we should just do good biosecurity the whole time. But if it was, what is the extra thing? Then certainly that heating is the extra thing, even though I still believe that would be great uh, most of the time. Some countries can't afford that simply because of the heating cost. I think you're, you're lucky in the US, you've got some uh, reasonable charges for, um, for, for power. Sorry, just struggling again with that. So the um, continuous movement of the, of the trucks, well, we have standard guides. The, the guides are pretty, pretty basic, but they're pretty standard as well. Um, we recommend that any truck movement has a, a record and a history, so the vehicle, where the cargo came from, where it went to, where it came from, you know, a pretty good uh, guide and always have the uh, contact number for the people that did the washing and the disinfection. So if you want to at any time, you just verify that this vehicle has been disinfected. It could turn up and you could think, yeah, that looks pretty clean, could be clean, but was it disinfected? And we have to be very sure and very, and very clear on those matters. When you have disease outbreaks, the, um, the categories apply, the no movement, the restricted movement, and the monitor movement. Those, are, as I said, those are pretty standard. Uh, the three kilometer zone recommended by the OIE, um, WHO, and FAO, and I, and I saw the USDA had very similar guidance. Different map, different, different, different presentation, but the same guide. Restricted movements, and then monitored movements. It would be customary for all vehicles to have these threat records. And farmers simply don't allow vehicles onto the farm without a verified recorded summary. There's just no need. Um, if you've got pigs to go to market, yes, I appreciate they're all ready to go. But if, that, if you've got to have that vehicle coming inside, then you've got to make sure it's been fully biosecured. The other option, and, and one that I strongly recommend, is part of the investment here it should be starting to make sure you've got loading ramps on the outside of the farm. Uh, a lot of farms now are also doing that with feed, where the feed is delivered to, to hoppers um, on the boundaries, and then it's recirculated by uh, specific farm vehicles. We find that a lot in Russia. Um, as much as you do uh, in, in Europe and in Poland, most of the farms now will have marketing ramps leading out of the farm. Those vehicles never actually come back in. Reducing the number of vehicles coming into the farm is, is a, great, uh, a great tool. So finally, and, and we've still got about uh, 10 minutes to go, what is occurring in Europe and China regarding above items? Well, there's a lot of experience. And I'd have to say China is not really something I would take the, the, uh, the lead from as how to do something at the moment. It's maybe how not to do something, um, simply because of the way the disease uh, spread. The, I was there in 2014 with the FAO. We trained 60 border guards, 60 border stations, I should say, um, how to control. But as soon as the disease hit in August uh, last year, that went out of the window. People just started panicking. They had an African swine fever outbreak on the farm. They tried to get rid of as many pigs on that farm as fast as possible, as far away as possible. Hence the spread across this uh, very, very huge country. Um, the government has done a check. They found that the virus um, was, was carried by vehicles feeding pig swill. Pig swill has now been stopped. 
theoretically, to be honest. There's legislation now where you cannot feed pigs well to pigs. Um, and the, there is a great effort going on continually. But I have to say that a lot of pigs are still being slaughtered with the disease. And that is probably one of the biggest threats uh, globally with people bringing poor products from China to other countries. And when I say people, I have to say it's mostly the, the Chinese themselves. Um, it, it's not other nationalities don't usually pick up pork and, and, and carry it around from one country to another, but um, the, they do. So not much to learn from them except don't let it happen to you. And that probably is a great learning. You're going to have controls. The USDA is doing some great guides. Get behind them. Get prepared for them. The other thing really is education. These are all uh, examples from Poland, where they did a great work, uh, government supporting the industry, all getting together. And if you can imagine seven years that virus hasn't crossed that country, whereas in three weeks it crossed the entire spectrum of China. So control and education works. Um, also, some, not necessarily simple, but some digital. Uh, if you just go onto YouTube, you find the OIE um, has a great uh, summary here. Carrying virus, traveling with virus, hunting, again, maybe a big challenge in the US, we covered that last time. Working with pigs, these are really great uh, educational uh, advantages, and I strongly encourage uh, this digitalization of, of, of data, bearing in mind we have so many tools available to us today. But the education and support in the USA is already there. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, everything is going ahead. The USA is, is putting out some great things. Is the education getting to everyone? That's the main thing. Don't bring it home. Uh, when you go hunting overseas, make sure you disinfect everything before you come back. Are they taking biocides with them in case they're not there on, when, when they want to come home? You know, these, these are some great uh, things. You don't have the disease yet. There's, there's ways to, to, to prevent it, and you've seriously got to look at those. And the border controls, you've probably seen in the paper there where you've got seized um, smuggling pork coming into the country, but it's not just you. Um, when I first designed uh, this slide uh, almost 18 months ago, this, this flying sausage I thought was probably a bit more of a tongue-in-cheek than was going to actually happen. But in July this year, we, we found African swine fever coming into Northern Ireland. Just look at the, the volumes there. That's how much uh, food is carried around. Goes into China. Canned luncheon meat going into the Philippines. And you have a dynamic population from, from Asia uh, in the U.S. as well. Now, the Chinese New Year hits us next February. I'm pretty sure people are going to be carrying around food at that time. So, you know, Heads up, make sure the, the, the border controls are there in place, and really encourage people or even your airlines to check people getting onto planes before they come back. You know, we did that uh, with liquids uh, a few years ago. We didn't mind the inconvenience. We were walking down gangplanks and people were checking our bags for the second time. That's pretty easy to do and just confiscate any food coming in the hand luggage. I just came back to the UK on uh, Sunday from China. I can honestly say I don't think any single bag was checked. Um, it's heat so maybe they did it underground, but the bag came within 15 minutes of landing, so if they did it, they did it pretty quick. We have no beagles walking around in Heathrow, no effort whatsoever to, uh, to control these uh, foods coming in. When I say that the, um, the Chinese have even stopped feeding pig swill, what I did do when I came to the U.S. in July, I, I looked at your regulations, and it is allowed. Um, small farms can feed household garbage to their own swine uh, in just about every state. I think there's seven or eight states that don't allow that. So maybe think about that. Um, you can see the, the, you know, this is your own um, uh, information. I just copied it just so you could uh, maybe review it. Um, if there is an outbreak and it's going to be in backyard farms and they're going to have pigs fed to other pigs and people are going to be living on, working on those farms, maybe visiting or working on pig farms, these are all things that you have to, have to check. So I think there could be a learning there. The other big thing I've noticed that's different is the perimeter fencing. I did mention this earlier. 
Um, I visited very big farms in the U.S., 75,000 sow farms, pretty much drive up to the outside of the shed. Uh, there wasn't any barrier controls. Russia, Poland, China, all of these countries now have these barrier controls. In Russia, they're double fenced. They're not even single fenced. In countries now, in Denmark, there's, there's a, um, a fence gone up across to protect them from Germany. In the Czech, uh, in, Czech, in Czech Republic, I should say, that picture in the middle, electric fencing going up to prevent wild boars straying into other areas. So fencing is a key factor. And at the moment, um, it's not happening in the U.S., I would strongly recommend to think about these barriers. Um, farms I was speaking to in, in Arizona, for example, they didn't have any barriers. They had wild boars running around the feed hoppers. That may be okay at the moment, but I guarantee you, as soon as you can start getting a challenge, it's too late to put the fence up. The double fence that you can see there is simply they have an area in between the two fencing where it's big enough, uh, wide enough to cut the vegetation and to spread some lime so that they can change the pH. If a feral boar comes up to the outside fence, maybe it salivates or, or defecates. The virus will take three to 15 days to incubate. If there's a double barrier, then there's less chance of that reaching the farm. It's not a total prevention because you could still have rodents going through some tiny fences, so you need to put um, rodenticides around those perimeter fences as well. So as we come to the, and come to the close, um, what would be the key areas? I think you've got a pretty good handle on it from, from the USGS guide that uh, Barbara shared with me uh, last week. You've looked at where the wild boars are. You've got some zones. You're getting prepared. From a farm point of view, I really recommend putting up fences and barriers. It's the first rule of biosecurity. Uh, the first rule of biosecurity, keep things out. I mean, that's a basic thing. Um, I think it's an investment, obviously. But I think it's something that uh, the team should think about and concentrate on. Upgrading the biosecurity now makes sense. Any upgrade of biosecurity gives better production. I think one of the things I've learned from Poland, since they've had this, this challenge, the pig production, the profitability has actually increased. The investment on barriers, the focus on biosecurity. Remember, this is a virus where there's no vaccine. It is a ticking time bomb, and there are vaccines being developed, but we know even if you have a first vaccine, you still get PERS. This is different. African swine fever has a huge mortality, and you lose exports, you lose livelihoods, and nobody wants to smell pigs burning in the backyard. You might think it looks good on a barbecue, but I can honestly tell you that experience is one I had not wish to ever see again, and it was really bad. To engage proven biocide to inactivate the virus, apply through protocols and essential barrier. Prepare and get ready. Um, that is the end of the presentation, and I'm ready to take questions. With. All right, as we move into Q&A, please feel free to place yourselves in the question queue by dialing pound two on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point please state your name and question. You can also submit questions in writing by using the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Please remember to select all panelists from the drop-down menu before submitting your question. Again, that's pound two on your telephone keypad, or submit it in writing using the chat box. Just remember to select all panelists before you submit your question. Uh, just, just for myself, Liz, this, this, um, this will be available to everybody after the call, I, pres I presume, the, the PowerPoint or the PDF? Sure. Yeah, I'll get a list of um, I'll get a list of everyone that actually signed on, and I can email it to them. So we do have a written question, and it says, could you expand on the environmental sampling recommend before repopulation? Is this a basic culture targeting any bacteria, or are you testing specifically for ASF? Um, it's a good question. Um, as I said, when, when we're looking at challenges, we, we really want to think about um, the pathogen that we're trying to inactivate. In that particular case, um, changing the pH environment 
we're really thinking about the African swine fever. If we were thinking about bacteria, that wouldn't really have a, a big impact on the gram-positive bacteria that are not so affected by just the pH environment change, where the gram-negative bacteria would be. So it's really specifically about the African uh, swine fever to, to answer that question. Okay, we have another question. Um, what disinfectant is being used in Poland is, is, that is effective against ASF? Um, gosh, that's, that's a difficult question to answer because I'm, I am really supposed to not be uh, commercial in this presentation. But um, I'd have to say that with sales of over 800 tons, they're, they're using um, uh, Vercon S at a dilution uh, between 1 to 200 to 1 to 400, depending on their challenge, based on the 6.4 log reduction that has been proven at the Spanish reference uh, laboratory. Okay. Um, what have the most successful methods been to keep trucks clean? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a good question also. And when, when you say keep trucks clean, um, we're moving pigs around. So it's not, you, you can't keep a, a, a truck clean when you're moving pigs around. But the, the, there is a, a, a new technique that I've seen um, in, in Poland where the uh, inner carriage has actually had like a Teflon coating applied to the side walls. And that does make things very much easier to, to rinse out than, than previously. That's not going to be a cheap solution, however. So I think um, the washing stations that, that you have in the U.S., I mean, they are, they are a great tool. And you should just make sure that the guys go backwards and forwards there on a regular basis. Um, keeping them clean will keep the biofilm down. What is the worst thing is if you just give it a quick rinse out and don't use a formulated uh, detergent, the biofilm will build up. The virus can stay within the biofilm just as much as bacteria. Bacteria forms the biofilm, really, but that can protect the, the viruses as well. So regular cleaning would be the answer. Um, I'm not sure if I'll see more of those, those Teflon-coated uh, vehicles on, on the inner uh, lower panels, but they certainly did uh, fit the cleaning process. The next question is, has any packing plant been able to get rid of the virus once introduced? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Has any packing plant been able to get rid of the virus once it's introduced? I'm not aware of that, to be honest. Uh, from a packing plant, I, I guess you mean where the, uh, the meat is processed. The, the one that we've been working with specifically is the, um, the slaughterhouse in Hong Kong, where they, um, they did have swabs of, uh, they, they did a P PSR test and they found the virus. We weren't sure whether the virus was, was uh, live or, or dead. That's one of the challenges with, with the test. Um, but they did disinfect the area, and they are again um, slaughtering uh, some pigs there. So I would hope that they've had negative um, tests during that process. I'm pretty sure they must have, otherwise they wouldn't have carried on going. Um, that's the only clear example that I've had of uh, that situation, because in Europe, there is no processing of uh, contaminated pig. Okay. Do you have any successful experience with other disposal methods besides burial and open burning? No. <laughs> Sorry, that's a very short answer, I know. But, um, <laughs> those, are the, those are the only two, unless you exclude those wretched people that have been throwing the pigs in the river, I suppose they could say that they've had a different process, but that's, that's, uh, that's not the way. And, and we learned this, to be honest, we learned this from the foot and mouth disease. Um, I was involved with the protocols there in 2001. In 2007, when we had the second outbreak in the UK, uh, we had culling again, um, but we didn't have it on such a scale, and because of the experience, we stopped everything within three months. But certainly the, um, the burial and the burning has been the most effective way, um, especially when such large numbers are involved. It's not like um, chickens where we can just go in with a, 
um, like the foam and, and, and kill mass amounts, but even those are still buried or burned. So I, I haven't seen of another way to do that, and I'd have to say that also happens with people with Ebola as well. How much does um, ag lime change the pH of lagoons and under barn storage? Um, it really, uh, you, you have to make sure you get the, the good grade which um, will, will give a pH, and you just have to basically um, add and test. The, the, all the slurry lagoons are different sizes. Um, if anybody has the compacted dirt on the top of the lagoon, the, that is also possible to scrape that off and bury it with the dead pigs, so that there's less of a challenge. But because the survival in the slurry is only 21, 22 days, according to the data, because it's been regularly tested in that environment, um, while you've got this three or four months to try and get that down, it, I haven't found another way apart from using something like bleaching powder could be used or agricultural lines to change that pH. And then we do get the records of, of, of no uh, virus in the test. Does it get outside the virus survival range? Um, yes, you, you should be able to, 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 I mean, if you remember the fecal matter is a neutral pH, so you're starting at around um, six and a half to, to eight probably, if you check the pH of, of that fecal matter. Um, so we're trying to move it three or four points, and with the adequate um, processes, that has been achieved. The next question is, does the um, Asian longhorn tick, is that known to transmit ASF? God, I'm, with all due respect, I'm not an entomologist. <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen the soft tick, the longhorn tick. Is, uh, I know you have longhorn cattle in the U.S., but I haven't heard of a longhorn tick, to be honest. I'd have to check and, and come back to you. I'm, I'm making a note on that as, as, I'm, as I'm speaking, but I, I honestly am not an entomologist, so I, I don't know. Yeah, if you send me the, the information, I can get it out to people. And someone asked, could you repeat the comments on lethal injection for depopulation as compared to other systems that you saw in Europe and or China? Um, yes, I mean the the um, the lethal dose uh, system that, that that we saw was using a particular chemistry that they injected to the the pigs on the transport, so that the pigs died on the transport and then were more easily. Um, uh, tip, I, I can't even know the word to say, tip to the uh, to the culling area. The worst I've seen is they buried alive in China. They just simply herded them there because it was less expensive and it's easier to move an animal that's still alive than it is one that's dead. And that was four or five thousand, actually four thousand seven hundred pigs buried alive. That's awful. You never want to experience that, to be honest. Um, you could. Um, you could kill them by slitting their throat, etc. But that's just going to uh, be worse from a point of view, in, in my point of view, sorry, because the blood will have the virus and then you're just spreading things around. Um, if I could just go, I think I can just go back to that slide quickly for you. Um, it did have the name, although you'd need a veterinary prescription and a vet would have to advise the actual um, chemistry involved. But I did make a note of that particular product when I saw it. Succinic um, acid, bis, and menthol sulfate. Uh, I did say that straight away seek veterinary advice and use a suitable guide. Because what occurred to me was this guy is injecting the thing. Um, what happened if he injected himself by mistake? That was my first uh, thought. They said that that never happened. Um, but that looked to me as a slight risk, where pigs do move uh, around um, without control at some point. Um, but certainly, moving them and, and getting to this point is it's a huge challenge. If you've got three or four thousand cows, you know you've really got to think that through before it happens um, and get some advice. Is there any evidence that ASF virus has moved through contaminated feedstuffs or ingredients? Um, that's another good question. There was uh, initial concern about the, the challenge through um, blood plasma and whether blood plasma was used in feed. 
In Europe, we don't get this challenge simply because in Europe it's against the law to use animal protein in animal feed. But I don't think that's the case in China. I think they still use meat and bone meal. Um, as you can see here, the survival in, in different states of, um, of, of meat and cooked meat and processed meat, it's definitely going to still be within uh, the meat and bone meal if that is used. So if, you're in, if anybody's importing that type of product and putting it into to feed, I'm not aware if the USA allows uh, meat and bone meal in, uh, in processed um, animal feed. If it does, that would be a challenge. Is composting used for carcass disposal of ASF infected pigs in some countries? Not that I've seen, no. And here's another question. What can wildlife agencies do to help uh, when to prevent outbreaks and or during outbreaks? Um, I think the wildlife agency would, would need to consider or balance, I should say, the, the livelihood of farmers and the life of feral pigs. Why do I say that? In Poland, there was going to be a culling policy, and the welfare activists managed to stop that policy simply because when a little wild boar is born, it looks a little bit like a, a bumblebee on legs. It's a very cute-looking animal, and if you manage to get that into the public eye, um, you have an imbalance. So I think the wildlife um, agencies can, can help the government from the point of view of uh, the balance of nature, um, we wouldn't want to cull all animals, but certainly culling policies to try and reduce this, uh, this growing number of, of uncontrolled wild boars would be, um, I think, uh, relevant. Okay, do we have any questions in the verbal queue? Uh, no, I'm not showing any questions at this time. Again, if you'd like to ask your question verbally, please dial pound 2 on your telephone keypad. Or you can submit your question in writing using the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Just remember to select all panelists before submitting your question. Okay, here's another one. When farms have tried to repopulate, how long are they waiting after C&D to restock the farms? Um, it does vary, to be honest. In Russia, I've seen eight months up to a year. Um, in Poland, four months was, was pretty uh, standard and, and worked pretty well. I'm not sure why it worked better. Um, I, I think there is, uh, not, not, I wouldn't say more control, but I think there is uh, better control in Poland than, than there was in Russia. In China, they've been trying to repopulate too fast. They, they simply have combined the decontamination as well as the repopulation uh, protocols and, and haven't really managed that successfully. I've only seen four that I know of that have repopulated. Um, there is two more that I saw last week that have started, and after 28 days they haven't had any challenge, but they're obviously waiting the full 60 days before they, they go ahead. So to answer the question, it varies. If you're very confident in your procedures, I think after four months is, is reasonable. Um, but if you're not confident and, and you have the capacity to leave, leave it longer, the other thing that will come to bear, I'm afraid, is that due to such devastation, there isn't always enough breeding stock to provide enough gilt to restock anyway. Uh, and that may be the condition that, that drives the restocking process. So given the lack of, lack of success, what else would need to be done to restock successfully? I think really you, you have to focus on control and biosecurity. And the, and the five-step process, I think by being prepared, um, knowing what you're going to do if you get a challenge. Imagine now if I just have a farm with just 300 cows. 300 cows is quite a big area to bury and incinerate 300 cows. So, can that be done on the land that I own, or am I going to have to contract some land? Where would that land be, and how successfully could I be in moving to that place? So a lot of it has to be preparation, I'm afraid. Um, 
As I said, we started in 2014 trying to prepare China. It just all went to a ball of soup when, when it actually hit. There was just panic set in. So I think what, what you're doing in the U.S. now is, especially with the USDA, you're looking really hard at what might happen and, and trying to get people aligned to prepare for it. Um, it could be like the millennium bug. If those of you uh, around at that time, we did a lot of work preparing for computers to go bust on the 1st of January 2000, and nothing happened. But at least we were prepared. I think in this case, be prepared. And let's just hope that that's not a ticking time bomb. So the last written question that we'll go ahead and take is, um, it says your table shows 25 days in slurry. The table also says six years at five degrees centigrade with no light. Wouldn't the bottom of lagoons be five degrees centigrade without light? I think that is uh, a good point, and it is one that I also raised with the, uh, the OIE. I didn't, I didn't want to raise it today because it, it creates more doubt, and it could have this long, long, long period of time. Um, but if, if that was the case, um, could we stir it? Could we get around it? Um, at six years, at five degrees with no light, but I, at six years, sorry, but I think if we change the pH, low and uh, to a point where the, the survival is challenged, I think one can compensate the other. So there are two cases where it's similar, I would agree. Um, this is sources of the OIE, so I, I have to believe uh, what, what they've done there, and they, they haven't compared the two. From, I didn't get a full reply the, when, when I asked Keith Davis. Um, he basically said that they hadn't compared the two exactly. Um, but I, I, I would agree with the, with the question put forward. But having this pH change, I think we can help compensate those two factors. Okay, very good. I just wanted to let everyone know we do have another uh, webinar scheduled next Friday on September 6th, and the topic is ASF surveillance and modeling. And we do have another webinar scheduled for September 17th, and the topic is ASF in China by Dr. Rich French. So please watch your announcements in your email. And with that, I will bid you all a great afternoon. And thank you very much, Tony. You're welcome. All right, that concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.